Good morning. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. You know, there used to be an old uh, commercial on TV. It said, uh, it's 11 o'clock on Saturday night. Do you know where your children are? Well, that's a question for some of you. It's 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> yeah. Those of you who are here, we welcome you in the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. For those of you who are joining us this morning by a live stream, May God's blessing be upon you and also to those who will be joining us this week in our worship as they listen to the recordings on Facebook and also on YouTube. May the glory of God be present in your life to direct you and to guide you as you continue your journey, our journey together through this life. We welcome you on this wonderful third Sunday of Easter to celebrate and to praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you, each and every one. A moment to uh, look at some announcements before we really get into our worship time. 
Our PYC, well, you have a calendar there that's listed, a lot of things, activities, and so forth. Please read over those. And also to, uh, to those others following that, this week on Monday, on Monday, tomorrow, uh, 6.30, our Bible study, Tuesday, coffee and yarn. Uh, Tuesday evening, April 16th, that will be our Presbyterian men at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. You need to let Martel know that you're coming for supper. Um, other, on Wednesday, uh, Discover Your Bible, Acts Bible Study Group on the 17th. Also, it's Wonderful Wednesday, and you'll need to sign up for that congregational meal. You'll find the clipboard down here in the lobby of the educational building. Or you can just give us a call, <clears throat> excuse me, here at church, and let us know that you're coming. We just need a count or the right amount of food. It's also the night that our chancel choir, along with the uh, youth club, will be meeting on w wonderful Wednesday night. Next Saturday, April the 20th, our Presbyterian women will be gathering at Montreat, North Carolina. And you need to contact Janet Fisher if you're planning to attend that. Uh, we do... Okay, they're taking the van. All right, good to know that. Uh, we want to celebrate a wedding. Uh, Thomas, Thomas Lewis and now uh, Daisy Lewis were united in, uh, in, in their nuptials yesterday. Uh, uh, the barn at Blue Sky Valley and uh, Blue Sky Farm in Dallas. And of course... Thomas is the son of Art and Susie Lewis, and they have gained their first daughter. So we welcome her to that family, and may God's blessing continue upon that family. You know, as long as we're, we're thinking things, when, when I first arrived here, <clears throat> excuse me, anyone that, that reached the 90th birthday was honored by this congregation. So I think we need just to honor Jerry Strapp. You know, his birthday, he just turned 90. There he is back there. <clears throat> Happy birthday to you. We also want to add our congratulations to uh, Madison Guevara on receiving, are you ready for this? The Edward Bland and Thomas, Tommy Pickney Paisley Scholarship, uh, which is given to a final, rising final level uh, Master of Christian Education. Is that what that stands yeah. for? Mace, okay, I thought it did. Uh, and, and there's a lot of things that, that went into that, but let me say she is a student of Christian education at Union Presbyterian Seminary, which is located here in Charlotte. So we congratulate her on, the, on this award. Yeah. Oh, our session is meeting on the 28th, so be in prayer and all of you ministries uh, look over that. Let me encourage you to look over and read all of your... Uh, your bulletin, uh, inside and out, especially those that are on the back, uh, we have lift, lifted up for you in daily prayer, members of the church and our shut-ins, friends and family of the church, our military, the other ministries of which we're engaged in and near and dear to our heart, the Golgotha Presbyterian Church in Guatemala, and those who are dealing with substance abuse issues. You know, we have a counseling center here and also a support group that meets here. Let me add this. Funeral services for Mr. Jim Sellers will take place today at 3 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Now, visitation is going to be at 2 in the fellowship hall. So 2 o'clock, visitation, fellowship hall, 3 o'clock uh, service here. And following the funeral service here, uh, he will be interned out here in the columbarium with his wife, Martha. Our prayers certainly go to that family continually as they lay to rest this 
man who was so dear and near to us. Growing up here in Cherville and uh, uh, part, of the, part of our congregation for, for quite a spell. Our church to remember, sister church this week in prayer, is the, um, is the Old Fort Presbyterian Church, which is, of course, at Old Fort. And uh, please remember the ministry here at First Presbyterian and also our, our ministries of the Christian churches throughout Cherville and our surrounding area. May God's blessing be upon us with the tremendous opportunity and responsibility he's given us. You know, we have a Sunday school class that has decided to step out and stretch their ministry beyond their classroom. And uh, it is the blessing box. How many of you seen it down here? It's a new, f- down here on the road. Okay, we're, we're fixing to hear all about that. So would a member of the class come on up? Tell us your name. Oh, we got, we got three. Oh, this ought to be good. And uh, tell us what this blessing box is all about. Good morning. I am Dalton, a member of the Way of a Child Group. Good morning. I am Dalton, a member of the Way of a Child Class. Our class wanted to do something for our community, so we came up with the idea for a mini food pantry. There are many people, including kids in our community, who go hungry. We decided to call our little food pantry First Presbyterian Church Blessing Box. It is located at the corner of the playground in the parking lot near Mountain Street. We need your help to keep the blessing box filled with food and snack items. You can put our donated items directly in the blessing box or in the fellowship hall, hallway at the main church entrance at the parking lot. We would like to thank Charlie Connor and Pete Kraft who donated the materials and constructed our blessing box. Please help us keep our blessing box filled so those these fortunate can have a little something to make their day better. Our message for those in need, take what you need. Our message for our church members, bring what you can. Thank you. All right. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Nothing like good moral support standing with you, too. All right. One thing let me also uh, encourage you to be aware of is at the end of the month, we're looking at the Song Fest, which will take place April 27th, the 10th annual Song Fest, at the uh, First Wesleyan Church. Uh, it'll be an opportunity for us to take up a love offering for the building fund at Cherville Area Ministries. Let me encourage you to take your your care baskets on the inside aisle, pass it over to your neighbor. Jot down a name or two of those that you wish for us to be in prayer for. Uh, you'll certainly want to, uh, if you're a guest with us, take uh, one of the uh, colored sheets, the yellow ones, and fill that in. It's also an opportunity for you to participate in our care ministry as well. Place those cards in the care boxes. They're gray in color with care written on them, one in the narthex, one on either side here of going out of the sanctuary, and then in other places here in the building. This past week, we had 92 prayers, 15 cards, one shut-in visit for a total of 108. And we want to say what a tremendous opportunity it is that we are given to pray for those who are sick, and those who need God's special touch. Choir.
Lord, you have promised to meet those who seek your face. Come now and reveal your presence to us as we make ourselves present to you. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, who taught us his followers to pray in a manner saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, what does the Christian church believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Please have all the children come forward. <clears throat> Got a large crowd today. Mm. Can you raise your hand for me if you've ever been camping? No? If you were over the summer and you came to King's Kids and you learned how to build a tent, Raise your hand. I know some of y'all did. Okay, so I remember when I was a little kid going on camping trips when I was young. One of my favorite family's activities on those trips was sitting around the campfire telling stories. Ooh. So, we would all put a flash. This flashlight isn't working. Our face, and then we try to scare each other. As I listened, I pulled myself over and over. <coughs> ghost, there's no such things as ghost. But that didn't keep some of the stories from scaring the absolute daylight out of me. I often found it hard to sleep late that night. My parents ended up regretting it because then I'd wake them up and be like, I'm having a bad dream. Now, that might be a strange way to start a lesson in church. It. Yeah. But even in Bible times, some people believed in ghosts and were afraid of them. Let's listen to this example. So what we're going to do is what we did last Sunday. Every time we hear Jesus' name, we're going to pass the flashlight. You've got to be listening. You've got to be waiting to see the flashlight get passed, okay? Max, you're sitting in the special seat again. You get to start. Okay. It begins after two men traveled on a long road to a town called Emmaus. They talked about Jesus' death and all that happened. As they walked, they, joined, they were joined by a man. They didn't realize at first, but it was Jesus. After Jesus revealed himself to them, they went straight back to Jerusalem and told as they told these disciples they'd seen Jesus, he suddenly appeared among them. He said to them, Peace be with you. Knowing he died, they thought he was a ghost. The Bible says that they were terrified, terrified. Here, tell me a terrified voice. Oh. So Jesus, thank you, asked them, Why are you troubled? And why do you why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see it's really me. Touch me and make sure I am not a ghost. Then they 
ghost. Because ghosts do not have bodies. As you see, the disciples weren't sure what to think. So Jesus something to eat. As he ate the fish, they watched. And he showed them he was a ghost. He wasn't a ghost. Because ghosts don't eat food. The disciples realized Jesus had come back to life. And they spent the next month or so with him. After Jesus returned back to heaven, those same disciples went all the his resurrection. They never stopped telling about what happened. You and I have been called to tell others about Jesus, just like those disciples. We must witness for, we must be a witness for Jesus. We must tell the world that Jesus is alive. Show me how we pray. Perfect. God, We serve a risen Savior. He is alive. Help us to be witnesses of what he has done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Lord, we lift you up. We lift you up and we remember your closing words to us before you ascended into heaven. That we are to go and we're to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we are to teach all that you have made known to us. We are to teach all that you have made known to us. And so we come, Lord, today uh, as your messengers here upon this earth uh, over 2,000 years later to banded together the church of Jesus Christ whose sole responsibility it is to tell so many others of your great glory, of your resurrection, and the teachings that you gave us when you were here upon this earth. We stand before you as those whom you have chosen. And Lord, our, our very souls we discover the freshness and the newness as we repeatedly are reminded, for we humans need to be reminded continually that we have been forgiven. It seems like it's just too good to be true. But the truth is, according to your word and the witness of your Holy Spirit, what you endured here in your short time upon this earth was you paid the price for us. You became our substitute for any sin that should be judged by the great God of all of the universe. That according to your word and the power of your Holy Spirit, that when the great day of judgment comes, believing in you as our Lord and Savior and loving you, and trying, trying, though sometimes we slip, sometimes we fail, <laughs> it's too good to be true, but we are forgiven. Your name be praised. Lord, in this world today, we see that there is a great need, a tremendous need, an outpouring need that the love of God through Jesus Christ be proclaimed. For well, the world itself seems to have turned into a stagnant pond where everything coming in, nothing going out, but our own personal greed that causes conflict, that causes war. We sit and we wonder, where in the world is it all going where is it all headed? Have we, been, have we been given rule of this earth by your almighty power to turn right around and rebel against that and cause so much violence and hatred and prejudice and hurt in this world? Oh God, we just pray on behalf of the world, right now, as this body called your church, we pray right now for the forgiveness of so many, Lord, that are living such ungodly lives. Hear us, we pray this day. We bow our heads in prayer, and we will issuing, be issuing our prayers for our sick. We need your healing for those who are heartbroken, we need to experience your peace and joy. For those who seek direction in life and sometimes find themselves cast in the darkness of wondering what it really is all about, we need your son in our life, your light to guide us on our way. We pray, Lord, for those who have been given the responsibility to judge the nations, to lead people, to be called to a high standard.
that in their place, they are to judge with righteousness. They are to judge with wisdom in your love. This we pray for all of our leaders. For our church, we ask that you would keep her pure. May she find the voice to speak the truth of God in Jesus Christ. No matter how, how sometimes we feel defeated, we'll never be defeated because you live within us. Grant us now, we pray, your favor and your blessing as we go about our worship, the teaching of your holy word, prayers lifted up, the fellowship of the faithful, and going forth to serve you throughout this week in the many ways in which you call us. We make our prayer. We seek your goodness always in our life. And all God's people said, Amen and amen. You know, in Psalm 24, we find this word of wisdom for us. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us worship God as we bring now God's tithe and our offerings. Abundantly blessed, abundantly blessed, but not just for our sake only, but that we might serve you, O God, by ministering with others who perhaps have fallen on hard times, ailments, misdirections, mistakes, but we who are abundantly blessed in so many ways, we find ways, Lord, to minister to those in Christ's name. To you be all glory and honor. Bless now, we pray, our gifts and those who receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated.
Let's get right down to God's teaching this morning from His Holy Word. We're going to be looking at our text, which is found from one of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Mark. You may turn in your pew Bible or your Bible, or you may just sit and enjoy God's Word being read. I do believe, I do believe with all of my heart that God always blesses the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Mark 16, 1 through 7. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the, tomb, the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him again, just as he told you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. In all of the various accounts of the resurrection of Jesus that appear in the four Gospels, I believe, I believe the most personal and the most touching and the most stinging words can be found in the Gospel that we just read, the Gospel of Mark. Now the phrase is so short that we can somehow just easily skip right over it. It's almost like it's just not even there without realizing the tremendous significance that it's had on that first glorious Easter morning as well as that day. I'll, I'll read the phrase again and emphasize the little phrase which I speak. The angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there just as he told you before he died. See how easily those two words get lost in the holiness of the angel as he speaks in the initial incredibly an amazement of an empty tomb in the shadow of the one who has been raised from the dead. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter. Well, why Peter? Why not John or James or Andrew or or one of the others. Why, why does Peter, why does Peter get this special recognition? Why Peter? Let's spin back 60 hours earlier. You remember it was Peter who, who said to Jesus, Jesus, I'm ready to die for you. But a couple of hours later, when it looked as if he might have to make good on that promise, he denied. He just didn't deny it. He denied it with loud cussing. He even, he even knew the name of Jesus. All four gospel writings record the story of Peter's denial and con conclude it by saying that Peter began to weep bitterly. And the question is, how long did he cry about it? 
were open to speculation. Some suggested that he was still crying when Mary came and made him aware that Jesus had been raised. Whether or not he was still weeping doesn't really matter. For we know he was still suffering tremendous feelings of guilt, shame, and remorse. And that's why this phrase means so much. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there when Mary showed up with the message? Andrew, James, John, Bartholomew, Philip, Thomas. I have the most wonderful news. Jesus is no longer in the tomb. He's risen just as he say he would. Jesus is alive. And oh yeah, Peter, by the way. <laughs> by the way, I almost forgot that the angel specifically mentioned your name. In other words, tell Peter that his failure doesn't make him a flop. Tell him that I am not letting him off the hook of serving me that easy. And a few days later, we have the wonderful encounter on the shore where Jesus erases Peter's threefold denial with a threefold recommissioning. Listen, Peter, do you love me more than these? Three times. Peter responds with, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And three times Jesus recommissions the one he called to be a fisher of men. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Louisa Fletcher wrote a little poem called The Land of Beginning Again. I wish that there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all of our mistakes and where all of our heartaches and all of our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. The land of beginning again. This little phrase, including Peter, assures us that there is such a place. A place of beginning again. What a grace-filled addition. Not only for Peter, but for any professing Christian who has ever denied the Lord Jesus in your own way. Whatever that way might have been. Uh, in any shape or form, one who feels as though their denial disqualifies them from being a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm coming up on the 24th anniversary of my father's death. He died May the 4th. I've thought about my dad an awful lot in 24 years. I think about if I could only see him and talk to him again. You know, I, I wouldn't try to persuade him that I love him. That wouldn't be the first thing. I wouldn't try to thank him for all of the ways in which he provided for me, you know, in those concrete little ways of life. Sheltered me, fed me, took me to the doctor, made sure I got an education. Yeah, I tried to quit school in the eighth grade. He wouldn't let me. He said, it might take you 12 more years, but bud, I got a goal for you. You're going to graduate from high school. Well, thankfully, I had a, he had a little help. I had a, I had a coach to intervene in there as well, along with uh, so many others in my life. A preacher named Willis Pruitt, so many others. But May the 4th is the anniversary of my, my dad. Oh, I wish I could go back because I treated my dad unmercifully. The mess I used to get into, not counting these other brothers of mine, you know. 
we were in something all of the time and it broke his heart. I know it did. It broke his heart so many times. I wish that I could just ask him, Pop, would you just please forgive me? I'm so sorry that I didn't honor my father and my mother like the word tells me to do. Please. My dad died on May the 4th, 2000. He died at home. He had cancer. He'd lived from January 2000 till the first part of May. And so we had the hospice nurses coming in. And one of the hospice nurses invested with him one time. One time she said, Mr. Lowe, in your life, what are you most proud of? What is something that you feel like is the pinnacle of your life, that you are just purely delighted by it? And he responded, My boys... My boys. You know what that did? That took old John and Steve and Tommy and me off the hook. We don't need to feel guilt and shame nor remorse. We don't need to feel that. He took care of it. All of the things of my life. My boys. Time and time again, y'all, we drop the ball. We fail. We mess things up. We walk through this life so often and with so many times feeling like a failure. I can't tell you how many times I have failed God's people. I've let God's people down in some way or another. And when I fail God's people, I can't tell you how I feel that I have failed God himself. If I didn't believe in the land of beginning again, I, I couldn't be, I wouldn't be standing here today. As was Peter, so it is with us. Jesus is always there in the middle of our failures. And he places a hand on our shoulder and he says, get up. Get back in there. Don't quit. I'm with you. I forgive you. You know, that's kind of difficult for some of us to accept. Because some of us think that we don't deserve we don't deserve to be forgiven. We've denied Christ in thought, word, or some deed. And we've come to feel as though our denial disqualifies us from not only serving him, but also from serving his grace in the form of forgiveness. And even taking the sacraments, whether it's baptize, baptism or communion. But this text tells us that Jesus is always far more interested in comforting, comforting the sinner than he is in the sin that you have borne. In the late century, Robert Bruce of Scotland was leading his men in battle to gain independence from England. Near the end of the conflict, the English wanted to capture Bruce to keep him from the Scottish crown. 
So they put his own bloodhounds on the trail. <laughs> Imagine that. When the bloodhounds got close, Bruce could hear the baying. His attendant said to him, we're done for. They are on your trail and they'll reveal your hiding place. But Bruce replied, it's all right. And then he headed for a stream, a big stream, a large stream. In fact, we might want to call it a creek that flowed through the forest. He plunged in. He waded upstream a short distance. And when he came out on the other bank, he was in the depths of the forest. Within minutes, the hounds tracing their master's steps came to the bank. But they went no further. The English soldiers urged them on, but the trail was broken. The stream had carried the scent away. A short time later, the crown of Scotland rested on the head of Robert the Bruce. The memory of our own sins produced by Satan can be like those baying dogs. But a stream flows red with the blood of God's own son. And when we pass through that stream, even the scent is carried away. By grace, through faith, we are safe on the other side and we take up residence in the land of beginning again. No sin hound can touch us. The trail is broken by the precious blood of Christ. That's what God in Christ has done for us. It's a, it's a new start. It's, it's a fresh beginning. It's a clean slate. Scripture says it this way, once scarlet, now white as snow. Several years ago, I bought a book. I saw it. Mm. I read a little bit about it, and I thought, I've got to have this book so I can read it. Uh, and so I bought it <clears throat> on Amazon. You can buy one just like it, too. Or you can borrow mine. You can keep it if you want it, because I've already read it about three times. One of the first Christian pilgrims to visit the Holy Land and record her experience was Ajira. Ajira was her name. Little is known about her other than she traveled from northwest Spain in 381 A.D. She was a nun. She traveled to the Holy Land. Just, three, just 41 years after, or let's see, 381, 81 years after it was become lawful to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And she goes to the Holy Land. And guess what? She kept a journal. <laughs> and that's what this book is. She spent three years exploring the Holy Land. I wouldn't want to encourage you to go over there right now, but if you can imagine a woman on her own from the northern part of Spain traveling, that gives you some kind of an idea of the guts this woman had. On her visit to Galilee, she visited a small church that had been built on the site known as the Place of the Colds because it was there Jesus built the charcoal fire John speaks of. This was an important destination for Ajira. It recalled a moment in time that transformed one man's life and his story had helped her overcome her own failures. As lovely as this little church building is, it was overshadowed by the statues outside of a, adjacent to the shoreline, a life-size portrait of Peter who had now met his Lord on the beach and towering over Peter stands Jesus, both forgiving and recommissioning this great man of faith. Christians who still visit the site sense Ajira, what she sensed, something momentous, momentous trans, transpired there and it speaks not only of Peter, but it also speaks of us as well. 
You see, the land of beginning was discovered on that first Easter morning by a man who desperately wanted to live there. And it continues to be discovered today by people searching for the forgiveness that only Christ offers. You see, my friends, the amazing news is that had Jesus remained in the tomb, Peter's denial would have remained an albatross about his neck and ours forever. But as Jesus left the tomb alive, God was authenticating the work of Christ and providing the forgiveness of sins through his death on the cross, the very forgiveness that Peter and we so desperately crave. Because Jesus is alive, Peter and you and I receive Another chance. Peter, as well as you and I, can receive the Lord's forgiveness and his grace and begin to dwell in the land of beginning again. Another chance, a new beginning. My grandson died. the Monday after Mother's Day. We attended that funeral and with the family there. And we came home. And on that day, Sunday, I tuned in to Trinity Presbyterian Church in Pensacola, Florida. And my friend, Hugh Hamilton, who had come to my grandson's funeral and met with us, was preaching on Facebook that day. His sermon was on beginning again. I flipped over to 106.1 and there was Ann Graham Lutz. She was teaching out of John and her whole teaching that morning was about God's love. And then I flipped over to our channel here And Brother Leonard Bumgardner was preaching on the power of the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit can do in our life no matter how tragic. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you, Ann Graham Lutz. And thank you, Hugh Hamilton for being the voice of God who says you can start new. You can start again. There is this land that not only allows you to relive without your sin, but also to relive without your hurt and your pain. Well, That's my teaching this morning. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but I hope you find something worthwhile to do with it in your life. God bless you. Our closing hymn this morning is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
to know more about Jesus Christ, you want to join a family of faith, our invitation is here. We'll do all we can to disciple you in the love of God through Jesus Christ. Just let your intentions be known. And now by the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you now and always.